So the 2024 Olympics, they're over, right? It's done, it's in the rear view. And for all the talk of bringing the world together and forgetting our differences, there was a whole lot of anger and division this year. From the pro-LGBTQ opening ceremony to the trans not trans boxing controversy to the Chinese doping allegations. But in focusing on these specific issues, most observers miss the fundamental problem that betrays the Olympics ideals of fairness and equality, right? And it's called technological doping. And unlike traditional doping, where you take illicit drugs to get an advantage, this kind isn't inherently illegal. In fact, it's ingrained into the games themselves. And you know, to explain this, let's look at one of the most infamous cases of alleged technological doping, the Speedo Laser Racer swimsuit. Right? And if you don't remember this bad boy, this was the full bodysuit that was co-developed by fucking NASA and carefully engineered to mimic shark skin. Though I will say the research suggests that the fabric plays less of a role in performance than the full body coverage. With that, reducing drag and making energy expenditure more efficient by minimizing muscle vibration and smoothing skin texture. And so what we saw at the 2008 Olympics in Beijing is that athletes wearing this swimsuit, they won 94 percent of all swimming gold medals and set 23 out of 25 new swimming world records. Which I mean, to put that in perspective, that many records had not been broken since 1976 when swimmers started wearing goggles. And so what we saw is that people complained that the suit was unfair and World Aquatics, the governing body for water sports, they banned the full body swimsuits. But like a game of whack-a-mole, the tech doping problem just kept popping up. Like in 2019, for example, when Nike created a super shoe specifically designed for a Kenyan distance runner. And with those, he ran a record breaking though unofficial sub two hour marathon. With runners and picking up the shoes commercial versions, the Alpha Fly and the Vapor Fly. And along with that, breaking a whole slew of distance running world records in 2020, prompting Usain Bolt to call the shoes unfair and laughable and to claim he would have run even faster if he had worn them. And yeah, research has shown that the Vapor Fly shoe line improves running economy by an average of 4%. And doing this with energy returning foam, a carbon fiber plate, and a curved shape that makes them lighter, softer, and bouncier. And what we ended up seeing is World Athletics updating its rules to cap maximum heel height at 20 to 40 millimeters, limit shoes to one rigid plate, and mandate that shoes be available to the public for at least four months. But still, even with the restrictions, Nike shoes had an edge over other brands. Which when you're talking about the best of the best of the best athletes competing at the limits of human performance, just that tiny difference, it can be enough to get you past the finish line before the next person. And so you have places like Scientific America noting that, quote, all else equal, a Nike-sponsored athlete may beat a non-Nike athlete simply because of shoe choice. Which is also why athletes deliberately gun for partnerships with winning shoe brands and shoe brands gun for partnerships with winning athletes. And if you're not sponsored, you can still get super shoes, but it gets very expensive very fast. Right, the initial price tag can already reach up to $300, and then they break down so much faster than standard running shoes, so you gotta keep buying new pairs over and over. And it's seeming like every four years, you got some new mind-blowing footwear coming out into the market. And so this year, it's these robotically applied spray-on shoes that perfectly mold around your foot like a shell with no laces, reducing friction and drag. And so the big question from some surrounding all of this is how do we stop technological doping? With one obvious solution being just to make everyone complete butt ass naked. And if you think that is absurd, you should understand that that's actually how the original Olympics were done in ancient Greece. Right, according to Greek legend, in 720 BC, an athlete by the name of Orsippus was running the 185 meter dash when his loincloth slipped off. But instead of stopping to fix it, he just powered on, dick swinging for all to see, and he won. And from there on, Olympians shed their clothes, they lathered up in olive oil, and they put on a show for the gods. With historians saying they believe that nudity exhibited their physical power and muscular physique to Zeus. Though also, the intimidation factor was a small bone. Now, of course, that said, for a long list of reasons, a nude Olympics probably wouldn't work well in the modern era. I mean, for one thing, the games were almost exclusively an elite male event back then, and because of its religious overtones, historians say that it wouldn't have been sexualized. Whereas today, you know, it's this global event, including every culture from hyper-conservative to ultra-liberal. You have multiple genders and an audience on social media that sexualizes literally everything. But then even if we put those concerns aside, we still need technology, at the very least, for the Paralympics. Right? If you're unfamiliar, disabled athletes use different devices to help them participate. Like, for example, in 2020, the blind pro cyclist Tristan Bongma tested cameras on his bike that mapped out the track in front of him, converted the images into audio signals, and then sent them to his helmet. And despite being 99% blind, he could zip down the track at over 30 miles an hour without crashing into anything or anyone. Though once again, things get complicated if we take another example, like running. Or because since 2012, people have debated whether double amputee sprinters outperform single amputee and even non-disabled runners. With those on one side claiming the double amputees gain height and therefore run faster, and then those on the other side argue that even if that's true, they start off slower and have a harder time navigating turns, so it's actually a net disadvantage. Which I will say, in fact, a study from 2022 backed up that argument, showing a significant overall disadvantage. So if we need technology where that creates inequities, what should we do? Well, one answer is to just give all the athletes the same equipment and apparel, but even that isn't as simple as it seems.
teams because one, every sport is different, which is why each one's governing body, not the IOC, decides those rules. And two, every athlete has a different body and different needs. So one universal standard might advantage some more than others. Plus, it would just wipe out the fun of seeing each person's unique style and choice of gear. But then also, even if we completely eliminate technological doping, we've still only made sports fair on the surface. Or because you can't just look at the players once they've already arrived at the game. You also have to consider how they got there and whether they enjoyed equal opportunities to prepare for the competition. You know, just like how some students get better education and tutoring before the SAT, some athletes get better training, equipment, coaches, dietitians, and physicians before the Olympics. Like for example, Team USA athletes stay at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. And that place is decked out with enormous state-of-the-art facilities for every sport you can imagine. I mean, we're talking about them adjusting the temperature, humidity, and altitude to exactly match the conditions of wherever you're going to compete. And then once American athletes got to Paris this year, instead of going to the Olympic Village, they could stay at the much more bougie high performance center. With that, offering complete medical and recovery facilities, a nutrition and meal cafeteria, mental wellness and psychology services, a lounge, high-tech massage tables, cryotherapy pods and sleeping rooms. Basically, Disneyland for athletes. And then, if you got the money, you can get the most advanced wearable tech and apps that track everything from sleep and diet to health and performance data. So for example, cyclists wear sensors that measure their speed, aerodynamic drag, and position on the bike. So if you start to get tired and you lift your head or your chest up a little, invisible lasers will immediately catch that and note it. And then, back at the training center, all that data gets funneled into a computer that your coach can use to make adjustments to your performance. And I mean, pretty soon, we're gonna probably see artificial intelligence helping coaches pick through the data and find things that the human eye might miss. And so all that's to say, you know, these problems or these the, these issues that we've been exploring, they're about much more than just shoes or a swimsuit. Right? A lot of people like to think of the Olympics as a time when countries that are vastly unequal economically and geopolitically can compete fairly as equals in the realm of sports. It's just bodies against bodies, a test of raw human strength and endurance. But in reality, we know that's not the case. The Olympics is a deeply unequal event, even if it's attracting the world's best athletes. Because each athlete, they're not just a human body. Right? They are a union of biology and technology whose potential potential is honed from the moment of birth, the moment the starter pistol goes off from the country that they're born in. Which to be clear here, is not a knock on the athletes who put in unbelievable amounts of work to pull off shit I could never do. That swimsuit's not gonna make me look any less like a dying seal in the water. But rather the point is that by regulating the Olympics a little bit more tightly and making the broader world a little more equal, we can make those athletes' achievements even more meaningful than they already are. Or we could also not do that because I like seeing America at the top of the medal counts. Because there is something about seeing that medal count that injects five times the normal amount of patriotism into my veins.